heel. As a team, we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen. Believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back, way back, back, way back. into the light. Into the light. Into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell. One inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. You. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's just game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning and losing. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now, I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's the team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individual 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 Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. Today is February 1st, 2012. And today, I'm bringing back on a good friend of the show and a friend of the Orion Talk Radio Network. Uh, You've all heard her before on my show, on numerous other shows, But if you pay attention at the bottom of the hour break, at the half hour mark, you hear her give a fallout forecast for three minutes. And tonight, we're going to be discussing a whole bunch of things, including Fukushima conspiracies uh, and the latest leaks from reactors, not one, not just the one in Illinois, but multiple reactors in this country have had problems. And I don't know if anybody else is talking about it, but I know I will be tonight. So let me introduce tonight's guest, if you already haven't figured it out, the one, the only, rad chick, Christina Consolo. Christina, welcome back to the show. Hi, Popeye. Thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I hope uh, you don't get SWAT teamed again because of me. (laughs) I hope so, too. I go everywhere with a video camera now, just in case. It's video cameras, your best friend nowadays, best, best friend. All right. So let's get into it. What's going on with these, uh, power plants around the country. Now you were telling me, uh, when we were talking off air, we were talking about the, uh, power plant in Illinois. I guess they had an emergency, you know, uh, unexpected, uh, loss of electrical power and it, they vented tritium gas but you were telling me that that's also not the only one that's leaking. So I'll give you the floor. Go ahead and get into it. All right. Well, um, yeah, two days ago, the Byron Nuclear Plant in Byron, Illinois, which is a little bit northwest of Chicago, um, had a cooling problem. One of the switches went out in the turbine building, 
And someone that lives around the area actually shot and uploaded a video to YouTube that I have playing on my channel right now, right when it happened, and you can just see all this smoke just pouring out of one of the reactors, and also out of the turbine building that sits a little uh, off to the side of the reactors. And they came out with an alert around 8 in the morning, and it was what was interesting is that morning I woke up, and I looked outside, and we had a yellow sunrise, yellow and pink and orange. And um, yellow is usually a sign of volcanic activity, but we don't have any volcanoes in Michigan. And the only other thing that I know that causes yellow skies besides uh, uh, really bad pollution is uh, radioactive isotopes, plutonium, iodine, strontium, and cesium will all cause yellow skies and yellow rain. And then, you know, an hour or two later, I hear that this new plant was having a problem, and I checked the, uh, the water vapor maps, and, and the stuff was blowing right over here, so who knows when the problem started before it was reported. But, you know, they came out with the same line of crap that they always do, which is there was very, very small amounts of radioactivity that may have been released, but they wouldn't give any numbers. And today, the EPA was supposed to be all over that site. And I looked at the reactor last night because I was interested in seeing what type it was because I thought, oh, man, if it's one of those Mark 1s like in Fukushima, you know, this could turn into a meltdown pretty quickly because from the news reports coming out, they're not able to cool the fuel. They're having problems with the cooling pumps. The pumps went out, and, and instead of them resetting themselves. Um, so this is, this is a separate problem from whatever was going on causing the, the smoke to come out of the reactor. This, this turbine facility was having some kind of issue, too. And, and the first responders on the scene said there was no fire in that building. They don't actually know where the smoke was coming from. And the EPA was supposed to be um, checking the area out today, and the NRC is supposed to be investigating the, the cause of the smoke in those two locations. But as far as I know, it's ongoing, and they came out later and said that um, there were some pipes that were broken in the, the cooling portion of the plant, and the water that goes through the pipes is the water that comes in direct contact with the fuel rods in the reactor. So, I mean, it's not just tritium that's probably being released. It's probably a host of all kinds of different radionuclides. And, you know, uh, those of us who are fortunate enough to have Geiger counters it's actually a very crude device. You know, it can tell you if the, the radiation is there or not, but it can't really break down the, the concentrations or the types of isotopes. You need a, a gamma spectrometer to do that. And so I guess we're, we're just going to have to wait and see what, uh, what the EPA tells us they found. But when I looked up the history of this plant, this plant was actually cited in the 80s for contaminating all the groundwater around it with tritium. And Illinois actually passed some legislation to get them to clean up their act. So and this plant has a history of problems going back 20 years. And I think the reactors were built like in 85 or 87. And you know, that's the, the problem that we're running into here is that these reactors are like way beyond their life expectancy. There's 10,000 parts for each reactor, and that's a lot of parts that can go wrong. And some of the conspiracy stuff that we're going to talk about might even actually tie into this because about 12 hours after Illinois had this, uh, this uh, plant alert, there was an earthquake north of Chicago in an area that has never been seismically active. And one of the theories about what happened at Fukushima is that neutrinos, which is a, a type of radiation, leaks down out of the reactors into the ground, and it forms these little channels that go all the way down into a layer of the crust, which is about two kilometers down, called um, methane clutter. It's uh, actually a, a methane layer that's solid ice. And... If these neutrinos are leaking into these areas, they can cause an explosive event where something called a, a nils warner syndrome occurs, and the methane expands 168 times its size and volume. And um, 
a French scientist, uh, says that that's what he thinks happened to Reactor 3 in Fukushima, is that the meltdowns leaked all the way down into this methane layer and it exploded, and that's why Reactor 3 turned into this enormous mushroom cloud. And then there's, of course, some other speculation that there might have been a nuke planted in that reactor. So... We're going to get into. Last night I uploaded the forecast, and as soon as I did, I see San Onofre in San Diego. Well, we're going to get into that on the other side of the break because we're going to get cut off. But that's the next one I want to get into, and uh, I actually have um, a video clip. uh, We can play the audio anyway uh, to go along with it if we need to. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. More on Fukushima and other radiological disasters or, or potential disasters when we get. Radiation leak at an American nuclear power plant, San Onofre, 45 miles north of San Diego, California. Officials say the leak is small, but as we've seen before, sometimes nuclear plants have changed the story after an accident. And look at this. Seven million Americans live within 50 miles of San Onofre. So ABC's David Wright traveled there to investigate what the real risks are. David. Good evening, Diane. Here's what we know. A very small amount of radiation apparently leaked inside the far dome over there, uh, barely measurable, quote, very, very low levels. That's the quote from a spokesman for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. However, the concerns were high enough that the plant is now closed. Officials say the radiation leak likely occurred in the steam generator tubes of San Antonio. I- I'm going to play the rest of the clip, but I got to point something out. Did not anybody else catch the like the double speak thing. It was just a little bit, Christina. It was just a little bit, just a tiny bit of radiation, not to worry about it, but we closed the plant anyway. But, right, uh, and they don't say the levels. They don't say what they are. Right. You know, like, we want numbers. What are the actual numbers coming out of there? Unbelievable. Just un- and I like how she said sometimes things turn out to be a little worse than what we hear right? originally. Like she admitted it. She's like, sometimes these companies, you know, it turns out they uh, they lied, you know, and uh, they they were hiding things from us in the beginning. Oh, you mean like Tepco? Uh, uh, you, you, oh, with Fukushima, like Chernobyl, like yeah, yeah. Go- like even today, even today in Fukushima Reactor Four, a pipe dropped off of the Reactor Four building, and first they said eight and a half liters leaked out, and then later they revised it to eight tons. So that's a thousand times worse than what they said originally, and that was just in a day. They went from eight and a half liters to eight tons. And by the way, it, it, it's come out recently that another uh, disaster, the BP oil spill, the Obama administration you know, was fighting with scientists to make sure that they played down the actual uh, scale of the disaster so it didn't sound as bad as it, you know, a, as it really is. It mm-hmm. still is. And they're doing the same thing with this. So there's just more evidence that they cover this stuff up. All right, I'm going to uh, – I'll get back into the clip so you guys can hear the rest of it. No phrase, reactor number three. No danger to the public, no danger to our workers. Did any radiation leak out? If there was any leakage at all, it would have been so minor. That steam system, which is supposed to be shielded from any exposure to radiation, was replaced in December 2010. So the question is, why did those parts fail now? It could be a mechanical issue due to uh, new equipment. There was also a possibility that the equipment was defective and that this is a harbinger of of more problems. Now, I'm going to stop it there again because this dovetails right in with what you were talking about in the first segment. Mm -hmm. About how they're breaking down and they need parts. They just admitted it. What I found out right before I came on tonight is that um, there's actually a lot of broken pipes in their turbine building, too. So it's almost the same thing that happened in Illinois two days ago, happened in San Onofre. And it's the water goes right through the reactors and touches those rods. So we need actual numbers instead of them just saying, oh, it's small, it's not harmful. It's blowing down wind to how many people, did they say, lived in that area? 50 like million? 50 million or some, oh somewhere. Oh, my God. Like and you know, Chicago is the same thing. This blew right through Chicago. Yesterday, no warnings from anyone. Keep your kids inside for a day. You know, not a big deal. Let's just take some precautions. 
right? I mean, it's, it's only your house we're talking about. It's you not know? a big deal. Relax. Don't worry that you have a, an arm growing out of your back. You'll be more productive at work. So you'll be a better slave. So there's, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to see here, Christina. There's nothing to worry about. Well, if Diane Sawyer says that it's true, it must be. Right. Well, let's see what else they have to say. I, I, we're only halfway through the not even we're about halfway through the clip, and we've torn it apart twice already. I mean, this is how disgusting this is. They're lying to you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, please. Later on, Christina and I will have a segment where we talk about solutions and stuff, and at least how you can mitigate your exposure. And please take notes because I want you all to stay safe. I want you all to stay healthy because Lord knows these scumbags don't want you to. One of dozens of U.S. reactors facing new scrutiny after Japan's nuclear crisis. Right on the coast, in the heart of America's earthquake country. Just next door to the Marine Corps' west coast hub, Camp Pendleton. We came here the day the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan melted down. Plant officials were eager to reassure the public the same thing could not happen here. Is this plant safe? Well, absolutely, this plant is safe. After Japan, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission updated its seismic model and in a report issued just yesterday found that 96 reactors in the central and southern U.S. are in regions at higher risk of a quake than previously thought. Major metropolitan areas are uncomfortably close to major nuclear power plants. Indian Point, just outside New York City, 20 million people live in a 50-mile radius. Dresden, just 50 miles from the heavily populated suburbs of Chicago. And if we don't make them shut it down, it's going to be too late. We can't wait for the NRC. We can't wait for the government. Now, it is important to underscore, it is not clear that this event had anything. I'm not even going to listen to because the last, you know, 12 seconds of it is him trying to, you know, the, the cover up at the end of it where they, it's important to underscore that this had nothing to do with anything and it's probably just a fluke situation, nothing to be alarmed. When the guy turns around, he's got a face growing on the back of his head. But don't worry about that, you know, everything's fine. There has, there, there's been no radiation leakage, we promise. We know, not the conspiracy angle aside, just knowing what I know now about how new plants are run and the, the type of, like, checks and balances there are with the equipment, to hear that there's broken pipes in two different plants a day apart from each other screams sabotage to me. And this, isn't, this, this wouldn't be the first two cases of something really crazy going on because in the last two months, we've had other issues. One on the East Coast, actually two of them were on the East Coast, one was at New Brunswick in South Carolina. There was a reactor cap that wasn't tightened down properly in one of their reactors. And when they started the reactor up, it almost blew up. They were really close to a meltdown. And the FBI should have been in there Whoops. investigating that because those reactor caps, they're so big. If you had 50 people holding hands going around this thing they would probably encompass it. It might even be larger than that. They're just and ha huge. how do you not notice that's on? Like, that, 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 that's not on. Like, oh. Right. I mean, there's a very, very specific procedure. It's the size of where, a house. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. How do you not put a reactor cap on properly? You misplaced it. I mean, that is a pretty What, do they got Homer important. Simpson working for them? Seriously, I mean, may maybe maybe Matt Growing was trying to tell us something when, you know, you see Homer Simpson with the rod in his hand and he, he drops it because the whistle blows and it, you know, gets stuck in his coat. I mean, maybe, they, well, maybe he was trying to tell you something, you know what I mean? A week ago, and I believe it was on a plant around New Jersey, I actually can't recall right now, I know it was on the East Coast, there was a, a fire on a catwalk right over the top of a cooling pool. If you look at pictures of a catwalk, it's all metal. Like, I don't know what could have possibly caught fire. And the event report released by the NRC said it took longer than 15 minutes to extinguish the fire. So, I mean, this is four things that have happened. That sounds like magnesium. And, I was you know, if there is somebody it's sabotaging these plants, like, the, all they're doing is they're burns, honing their if skills. If there's accelerant or something on it. And in that case, if it took, like, 15 minutes to go out, I mean, I, don't, I wasn't there, but from my experience, that sounds like it was magnesium or something because uh, 
metal fires like that burn so hot you can spray them with oxygen and it, or you can spray them with water and it actually breaks it down into hydrogen and oxygen and just feeds the fire more. You need a, a special uh, extinguisher uh, called Purple K. It's a powder. It's made specifically for metal fires like that. So who knows? I mean, usually if a fire like that in a catwalk takes forever to go out and there's like no garbage can or anything up there, that's kind of shady. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Three minutes. We'll be back. And this is the bottom of the hour break. So make sure you listen. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Christina, during the break, we were talking about, uh, what is it, Fort Calhoun uh, in uh, Nebraska, the one that got flooded a couple months ago, and that there's just a complete news blackout on that. What's going on there? Do you know anything? No, there's actually two plants, Cooper Nuclear and Fort Calhoun. And uh, a few days after they flooded, and the news reported that their spent fuel pools are actually in the ground and were covered with flood water. Obama declared a news blackout on both of those plants. And I've had a really difficult time coming across any information about what's going on there. I'm, I'm going to be starting up a Facebook page just on those plants so where people can post stuff that they find out. Because um, Nebraska has been a real hot spot for some of the EPA uh, RAD monitoring readings. And, you know, it could be Fukushima. It could be from there. It, it could be from, you know, print sources. In, in Europe the other day, they detected in Finland, Norway, and Sweden, iodine-131. So that's probably coming either from a local reactor accident that we don't know about or something else kind of crazy that could have happened is the high atomic weight fallout from Fukushima was slated or changed by some of the incoming solar flares. And that's something I don't know a whole lot about, um, but there's a, a guy named Potter Blog on YouTube who seems very, very knowledgeable about these types of things. And every video that he's put out where he's predicted some of this crazy stuff happening, it has. So I watched all of his stuff, and um, and I guess we'll we'll have to see with the increased sun activity if that starts happening more often. But my understanding in Finland is that... Uh, they're they're pooling all their um, radiation agencies together to try to determine the source of where where that just came from. But it could have been Fukushima. It takes about eight days for it to start to disintegrate, and uh, they they didn't say what the levels were. Again, it's always you know they were just a little, and they weren't too bad, but they never give us any numbers. They're a little better in Europe than they are here. But, um, yeah, we don't know what's going on in Nebraska still, and that, that flooding happened, like... But see, that's what's scary, is not only the, the fallout from Fukushima, but now we have things going on here at home, which will do nothing more than magnify the, the already horrible effects. You know what I mean? So, and I, when... When they black things out, it's never a good thing. When they don't want you to see information, it's not because good things are happening. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's not because everything's hunky-dory. If everything was hunky-dory, they'd have 18 cameras in there making sure you saw that. It's not. So there is a problem. Uh, hopefully, uh, we, we'll be able to get some sort of information out. You said you were thinking about uh, creating maybe a page where people could go to uh, get at least the most info that there is out there all in one spot. Right, right. I did that for uh, mutations. We have a mutation watch page now. And uh, another page, uh, where's Jim Walsh? He was a guy from MIT that was all over the place when Fukushima first happened. He was on CNN every night. And he was, uh, he was pretty much freaking out about the spent fuel pools catching fire. And all of a sudden, you don't hear from him any anymore. And I've written to him numerous times, and I've posted the letters on Radchick, and he's never responded. So we created a, a Facebook page for him. And he actually posted on there. He said, am I that hard to find? <laughs> but he still hasn't answered my letters. <laughs> What's the name of the Facebook page that, uh, well, actually give out all the Facebook pages that you have and any YouTube channels and any websites that you've created, you know, with all the information about uh, the radiation and everything else. Go ahead and give them all out. Well, if you, if you just type in radiation on Facebook, there's actually a bunch of good sites. Radiation Watch is one where people with Geiger counters post their readings. That's all they do on that page. Uh, radiation Health Solutions is a page where they just post stuff about mitigation. 
Then there's uh, my Reactric page, and if you type in radiation, Reactric pops up, um, where we we put it's kind of a news aggregate, um, and, and we post uh, data and and some of the conspiracy stuff that we we're going to talk about tonight. I posted on there as well today. Um, you know, just sharing information with people who who want to learn more, and um, I have a YouTube channel, iChica X4 where um, all the forecasts are uploaded to that and then occasional new stuff that I cover. And do you have, uh, is there uh, an email or anything that people, in case they have some information about, like, you know, maybe an insider or something, somebody that wants to, uh, whatever, maybe someone lives around the area and they they know something that's going on over there uh, in Nebraska. Do you have uh, an email or, or any way somebody could get in touch with you in case they have some info? Oh, absolutely. Um, any of those spots, I check, I check all of them daily. And, um, and my direct email is, uh, Christina X4 at yahoo.com. All right. Perfect. Now, uh, we've got about five minutes before we go into the next break. So I want to kind of segue into the conspiracy end of it now, uh, and touch on that for a little while. Now I know there's a lot of different uh, theories out there as to what could have happened. Uh, we'll take Fukushima to be the first one. So people would say, "Well, this people, you know, these th- this country did it, or, or the Illuminati did, it, or this or that." And when I first heard that, I was like, "Well, it could be because they have harp, and uh, they have, if you know about harp, they have technology that you don't know about." So let's just say they have scalar technology because harp is kind of you know the uh, the older version of it. They have newer stuff that's much smaller and more powerful, although they still use it. But they have this technology that they can create earthquakes with. They admit they can do it. They adw- admit that they can manipulate the weather. So, is it possible that they created this earthquake? Now, did you ever see the earthquake? Uh, there was this thing someone put up like over a course of like two or three weeks, Christina, and it, it was charting all the earthquakes. Like it was a map of Japan, and then there was a dot for every time there was an earthquake, uh, and it would tell you like how powerful and everything it was. And there was this cluster of earthquakes right around the northern part of the island, and where that part of the island is underneath Japan, Japan actually is sitting on a bunch of hollow lava tubes for a lot of people that don't know anything about the earth. Uh, you can go look this up. Japan's sitting on a bunch of there's hollow lava tubes underneath it and if japan ever had a strong enough earthquake and those lava tubes collapsed the island above it would sink and the northern part of the island would literally shear off and slide into the pacific ocean and that's where this massive amount of earthquakes was so it kind of makes one wonder were they focusing any directed energy weapons uh at you know at japan and doing this now the princess, I believe, of Japan, the royal princess, she came out after the earthquake and said that they had been threatened uh, by the Illuminati before with earthquake technology and stuff. And she, she just used the term the Illuminati to kind of cover, you know, as a, I guess an umbrella term, the people that she was discussing. But, you know, she never really named names. Uh, and there's, there's other stuff. I mean, Benjamin Fulford... Uh, said kind of the same thing, but he said that they planted nukes or something underneath there. And I kind of don't believe that guy. I, I, not kind of. I don't believe that guy. I think he's full of crap. So I don't think anybody planted nukes or anything underneath, uh, you know, in the lava tubes or they used underwater, you know, um, nuke torpedoes or anything like that. But I do I, – I would believe something more along the lines of Stuxnet getting in there, which that's another thing. Um Christina, we've talked about how those reactors should have gone into their safety mode and they didn't. So why didn't they do what they were supposed to do? Why did they completely and utterly fail? Mm-hmm. Right. There, there were actually nine cooling systems, nine backup cooling systems at Fukushima that all failed. And they were independent of the electrical source. Um, and that, that's something that's never really been answered. And... and there's, in in studying the the uh, Fukushima disaster, you know you can't help but come across some of these uh, conspiracy theories, and I really haven't paid that much attention to them, or at least I I didn't before. But um, 
I keep coming up with uh, scientific evidence that kind of um, adds um, credence to, to what some of the people have said. And um, there, there's really two, two major ones that, um, that have been somewhat mainstream in the I'm gonna, alternative. I'm going to cut you off right there because we're going to come up to the break. And we'll pick it up right. right exactly here when we come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. People are always asking me. At all. When we get back, Christine is going to get into uh, the two main conspiracy theories that she knows of regarding Fukushima and the evidence that she's uh, seen to perhaps back these up. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Just remember, anything is possible, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with the final segment of the first hour. Do not fear... We will be back with a second hour tonight, as always. So don't go anywhere. We still have another full hour after this. Now, getting back into it without wasting any more time, because this is really, really something that needs to be talked about. Many people don't like to talk about this. Some people like to shy away from it because it's conspiracy, you know, and there's maybe it seems too wacky. Okay, but. There is evidence that points to some, some things, perhaps uh, Stuxnet being used, you know. So there are things that should be researched and looked into. And again, I've said this before with 9-11 and any, anything else. I think we should put all the evidence on the table and then let the facts, you know, and the evidence take you to the conclusion. Don't try to draw your own conclusion just from what you see, you know, what does the evidence tell you? Well, the, you know, all the evidence doesn't point to this theory. Okay, well, we can get rid of that theory. So does it point to this theory? And that includes the government's official conspiracy theory because that's a complete lie. So, Christina, what evidence have you found to back up these two conspiracy theories, and I'm doing air quotes, conspiracy theories about Fukushima? First, uh, list the two conspiracies and, and then... Um, Tell us what evidence you've seen yourself, uh, or I should say tell the listeners because I already know, but tell the listeners what evidence you've seen yourself to kind of back this up. Well, the, the two main guys that I'm going to refer to, uh, one, uh, one, his name is Jim Stone. He's an independent researcher who used to have above top secret clearance with the National Security Agency. His specialty was in industrial warfare and he has dedicated his life to exposing the elite from the technology perspective. And he's got a website um, where he uh, details all of his research. It's very extensive. It actually takes about two hours to read just the, the Fukushima sabotage report. But in a nutshell, um, the three main points that he makes is, is, well, number one, what would be the motive for someone to do this to Japan, and there's actually a verifiable motive that Japan had agreed to enrich uranium for Iran, and this was reported back in February of 2010 in at least four different news sources that I found. Um, one was Ynet, one was Inside Japan, another was The New American, and another was an Indian periodical called the Hindustan Times. They had, in fact, agreed to do that, and the U.S. was not happy about it. His, his three main points were that, according to the seismic graphs, the 9.0 earthquake was not a 9.0. It was actually about a 6.8. The second point is he believes that we nuked the trench and caused the tsunami. And the third point is that we or somebody nuked reactor three, which caused um, the giant mushroom cloud explosion and possibly reactor four too. And there's really just four images that are very damning and, and very supportive of his theory. One is there is almost a complete absence of earthquake damage in the areas closest to the quake. And he's got some pictures online showing what the cities looked like as the tsunami rolled in. All the cars are parked in their spots. Nothing is askew. 
There's people walking around conducting business. And I mean, in Japan, they're, they're used to earthquakes, but in Sendai, which was the closest to the epicenter, there's actually some footage of a newsroom. There was a camera that was running in a newsroom at the time in Sendai. If this had been a 9.0 in the proximity of where this epicenter was, the people standing in this newsroom, according to the physics calculations that he's done, should have hit the walls going about 44 miles per hour, which would have killed everybody in that room. But instead, what you see is a lot of equipment kind of moving around on top of tables, some of the shelves wiggling, some of the lights swinging. Um, not what you would expect to see with a 9.0 earthquake, especially when you compare the images of that city in comparison to the Kobe earthquake, which happened, I believe, in the mid-90s. And that was a low eight. So this was, um, you know thousands of times higher in terms of magnitude and there's literally no damage. It was the tsunami that came in that caused all the damage to the cities. The second picture that he has up is a damaged reactor building. And even the worst hydrogen explosion could not have destroyed 15 foot thick columns of concrete and turned it basically to dust. What you see happen to those reactor buildings is basically what you saw happen to the World Trade Center in Building 7. Concrete was pulverized, and hydrogen can't do that. At least that's what some of those physicists say. The third picture is that in Reactor 3, well, in the building, the reactor's completely gone. It's just gone. The steel reactor is completely gone, and a hydrogen explosion could not have done that. And the fourth picture is something called a Magna BSP camera. It's a camera that has been manufactured by an Israeli security firm, which can be converted into a nuke gun. And the reason why this camera was reportedly so big and put into the reactors at Fukushima after this Israeli company was hired to run security for the plant, is that they said you needed to have stereoscopic vision, which is a camera with basically two lenses. So you're focusing just like your eyes do. You know, you see depth perception, you see in 3D when you have both eyes open. And they wanted these stereoscopic cameras for some reason in the containment of the building. And when I worked in the eye, that's all I did all day was take stereoscopic pictures of the eye because there's nine layers of the retina and you want to see which layer disease is occurring. There's really no reason to have stereoscopic images of a containment unit that's basically a donut. So you would be looking down a rounded hallway. But that's what these cameras were. They weighed 1,000 pounds. And this company installed them in reactors three and four, four months prior to 311. Now, he also speculates that at the time... Shady. Israeli, That's shady. At the time this Israeli company was hired to come in and do this security work, that they could have transferred the Stuxnet virus into the control room computer system. It's basically just on a jump drive. And all someone would have had to do is plug that jump drive in and transfer the data, and the Stuxnet virus would have done the rest. And that's the only way it can get in. It can't get in any other way because those things are connected to the Internet. I had this discussion mm -hmm. with a hacker on my show that I have on, and Winston explained, and he's, we've gone over this twice, that uh, when we brought up Fukushima when he was on, and we just, we, he, you know, he explained the only way it could have gotten in was if the secretary might obviously have like an internet connection, you know, on her computer so she can, you know, maybe go out via the internet, but the centrifuges, nothing would be hooked up to the internet and it would have to be somebody on the inside. Literally, if they downloaded it off the computer like that, they, you know, the chances of an accidental download are almost nil. It would have to be purposely ripped off her computer or brought in on a memory stick and then implanted. There's no way, no way that a virus could get, quote-unquote, from the Internet to the reactor. So somebody had to be on the inside. And they've admitted yeah. that uh, Israel and the United States have admitted, very quietly, I may add, but the articles out there, um, actually, if you go look up uh, on uh, YouTube, 
um, what is Stuxnet? I believe is the title of the video. I made a video with Stux about Stuxnet with a couple different uh, you know video clips that I put together. And uh, part of it was I showed this article where it was buried in the article. It was like a two-line thing. But they said that uh, Hillary Clinton had bragged that her, um, you know, th the United States and Israel had uh, tested Stuxnet. And then that, you know, it, it alluded to they had used it, and that's what screwed up uh, Iran and set them back like another six months or eight months or whatever it was. So, and they boasted about it. You know, obviously Fox News and stuff didn't pick it up. But if you look in these little periodicals that actually have the courage to, you know, print the truth sometimes, it, it was quoted that, you know, that's what she, you know, she was quoted as saying that and everything. And it wasn't like a blog. It was just one of the local area. And I forget, um, I forget exactly what the title of it is, but I'm sure you just Google it or, you know, star page or whatever you use and you'll find it. So it, it wouldn't surprise me that they did use Stuxnet. So go on, Christina. Yeah, Stuxnet is real, and it's it's a very interesting. It's the most complex computer virus ever written. And whoever wrote it, it probably took about, they say, 30 to 40 people working about six months around the clock to develop this thing. It's that complicated. Yeah, it wasn't designed in someone's basement. It wasn't... Uh, and in fact, Stuxnet now isn't even the worst. There's uh, there's another one out there called the Dooku virus, and yeah, there, there's that's up, there's brand even, new. Yeah, there's even other stuff out there. Uh, again, I, when Winston's been on, he's talked about this stuff. It's scary what they're creating, and they've said that the Stuxnet was created with by a nation state. It was not created by some dude sitting in his basement and had to take a team of people doing it, you know, round the clock working on this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna get cut off by the top of the hour break. Stay tuned. We'll be back in about seven minutes hour number two don't go anywhere we're going to get more into fukushima conspiracies and then we're going to get into some solutions we'll be right back we are back with hour number two here on down the rabbit hole i'm your host popeye from federaljack.com and ladies and gentlemen before i get back into it i'd just like to remind you to check out joe joseph's show the Freedom Link Radio program on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. and on Sundays from 7 to 9. Joe's a good buddy of mine, hell of a researcher, and uh, he, he's really in this for the long haul, and he's doing it for the right reasons. So I support him, and uh, I ask you guys to do the same. So let's get back into it. Now, first hour, Christina was talking about how uh, Fukushima had recently leaked some radioactive water and at first they said it was liters, and then they said they admitted later on it was tons, which is a little bit of a jump, you know, uh, uh, just in case people aren't sure. But I, I want to actually play you the clip. Uh, it's from, uh, I think it's called, yeah, CCTV. So I guess this is the, this is the Chinese uh, television, uh, you know, state television talking about Fukushima and, and the, the radioactive water. And this is where she actually says it's just liters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. In Japan's stricken Fukushima nuclear power plant has leaked more than 600 liters of water over the weekend. Now, you, you, now, this is Chinese state television, so it's not Japanese. So the number was a little higher, but it's still liters. 600 liters is nowhere near 40 tons, okay? Massive disparity. Don't even get me started. Anyway, okay, Christina... The second thing you yeah. wanted to get into, and this is really important before we forgot, before we forget about it and go anywhere else, you had talked about this with me before we even came on air um, the first hour. This is something I know you really wanted me to play um, the clip that's going to back up what you were taught, what you're going to talk about. But tell the listeners what you told me about the Mox fuel rods. Remember, they made a big deal about all oh, the Mox fuel, the Mox fuel. Tell them where you found out, or what you found out, I should say, about the Mox fuel. Yeah, I had seen this video called A Theory of Fukushima by a Finnish scientist named Arto Lori. And I was curious about who this guy was, and I, and I found out a little bit about his, his background. He had worked in nuke plants his whole life, worked his way up from being an electrician to uh, some type of, like, A-plus status working on the reactors. And he started getting really concerned when everybody that he worked with was dying of cancer. Plus, he had issues with the spent fuel. But he knows a lot about geology, and he also knows a lot about HARP, and he also had some inside information about some of the fuel that was running in the reactors in Japan, and 
his theory was so compelling, it actually made me cry when I watched it because I thought what had really bothered me at the beginning of the year of 2011 was all these mass animal deaths, these birds dropping out of the sky everywhere. And his theory actually ties all of that in together with what happened in Japan. His theory is that Japan was running this unstable MOX. It's 6% plutonium, which had always been considered dangerous, and it came from Russia uh, disarmament and from some, um, at some facilities called Cellafield and Super Phoenix, where they had all this leftover spent fuel that actually should have been disposed of. But what they decided to do is reprocess it because it's getting really expensive to be digging uranium out of the ground and turning that into fuel. So some woman named Anna Lavergian from the IAEA gave the go-ahead to let Russia and France sell this bad mock fuel to anybody who wanted it. And Japan took about 70% of it. She later got fired for making that decision. For the first year or so, things went okay. Now, why is it bad? Because it's unstable? Yeah, it's unstable. It's 6% plutonium. And so what, what, what happened after the first year, is it was time for Japan to do maintenance on their reactors. But when they went to open the reactors that was running this bad MOX, the heat and steam coming out of the reactors was three times higher than it should have been. So in order to compensate for that and to prevent all of these reactors, and there's 36 of them running this type of fuel in Japan, or there was, they opened all the reactors and vented them to the air. And this was just before January 1st, when we had all these birds dropping out of the sky everywhere. This created such an enormous cloud of ionizing radiation over Japan that the IAEA and NATO, which monitors radiation levels throughout the world, thought that the atmosphere might actually explode. The levels were so high, it was actually swelling the ionosphere. So first they tried to calm everything down with chemtrails, and that didn't work. It wasn't able to disperse the radionuclides. So then they started using HARP. And what they did with HARP is try to push down the radiation and disperse it so it wouldn't explode in the atmosphere. But what they didn't know was going to happen is it actually acted as a conductor or like an iron nail to the ground and it excited the quartz in the rock, which started vibrating. The energy release that happened in the plate was caused by this explosive release of energy, which resulted in a 9.0 earthquake and a tsunami. Now, when I first heard that, and I actually watched it a couple times, I was like, this explains these bird deaths, because they have never sat well with me, how all these, these animals just started dying after the first of the year, and they were blaming it on fireworks and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's like the canary in the coal mine. You know, when you see we, birds right, start dropping exactly. off, there's a problem. Exactly. And then these meltdowns that happened in Fukushima, in Fukushima as a result of the earthquake and the tsunami, and possibly, you know, any other type of, you know, sabotage that might have been going on from Israel and the U.S. being picked off at Japan for enriching the uranium or for Iran, um, there's this methane clutter layer that lies about two kilometers under Japan, and when it's heated and the gas expands, he says that is what caused Reactor 3 to explode the way that it did. And if that's true, we've got a really, really big problem everywhere because these new plants all leak these neutrinos right into the ground and they form these little tubes or channels that go into this frozen methane gas layer. The fact that we're having earthquakes around nuke plants, and we've been having them, if you, if you look at, you know, the Virginia quake, we had 10 plants that had, had to get shut down because of that quake. You know, are they affecting each other? Are the, the nuke plants causing the earthquakes? Are the earthquakes causing the nuke plant problems? Or are there other forces at work? The thing that was so compelling about this, though, is a few months after this theory of Fukushima came out, MIT published a research paper showing that they detected 
ionosphere disturbances over Japan that were three times higher than they had ever detected before in history, as long as they've been doing this. The worst one they had ever seen was over Sumatra when they had the Indonesian quake that caused a tsunami. I heard about this. Um, there's actual, uh, um, I saw a, a satellite image uh, that you see uh, of uh, the cloud layer, and you could see the cloud layer. It was like a thick cloud cover. And yeah. you could see that the cloud layer over uh, around northern Japan was actually somewhat dispersed. And what they were saying was the area above, uh, you know, right above that area where the earthquake uh, took place was uh, was hotter. It was like a, a lot hotter than the surrounding area around it. You know, like there was this pocket of, you know, superheated air there almost. And it, if you have that hot air, it, it would burn away those ice crystals and stuff. And melt everything away there up in the in the cloud layer there where it's cold, and uh, you, the only thing that could do that, or or one thing I should say that could do something like that would be a directed energy weapon. And they mm -hmm. they they've even had that. That's the same kind of evidence when you look at uh, things like you know, and this isn't even connected, but the death of Paul Wellstone, where it, the evidence points that they used some sort of EMP weapon to take his plane down. Uh, the cloud layer above where the, the airplane had its technical difficulties and crashed, you know, I'm, do, I'm saying air quotes when I do technical difficulties, the uh, cloud layer above it had a hole punched through it, just like, you know, what we're talking about here. And if you go and right. look up on YouTube, there's videos where people will show you, you can see satellite images, video people took from the ground where you can literally see a hole in the cloud layer. It's really weird. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Make sure you tune in, ladies and gentlemen, on Friday, this Friday. Uh, I believe it's the 3rd of February. Let me check my calendar. Yes, it is. The 3rd of February, 2012. I will be resurrecting yet another researcher from the grave. This Friday, it'll be May Brussel. Some of you may not know who she is, so I'll, I'll be reading a brief bio of her and then I'm going to be playing a, a bit of a clip from one of her broadcasts where she discusses uh, the deaths of the many witnesses in the JFK, uh, related to the JFK assassination. So uh, it's from 1977, December 11th, 1977 to be exact. So we'll be going back uh, about 35 years. So strap yourself in for Friday's broadcast. I will be bringing the late May Brussel back to the airwaves for a brief period of time. Okay. So getting back to tonight's topic, Fukushima, and talking about what Christina was just talking about last segment with the MOX fuel. Now, she talked about this theory about, or I shouldn't say theory, but the evidence that points that they were using this MOX fuel from Russia. Well, it's not just some quackpot theory, okay, because um, – during uh, right after Fukushima, when it was happening and the reactor blasted, actually, you know, when they were CNN was showing it, Elliot Spitzer was on. And that, Christina, what was this guy's name again? Uh, Jim Walsh, right? I think that was his Jim name. Jim Walsh from MIT. He's an international security expert. And, um, yeah, he. Uh, he was chatting with Spitzer, and they. You he was know, chatting with Spitzer, and 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 uh, told, and I had, I didn't actually see any interviews with him after the segment, so I'm wondering if you want to talk about that. Um, but one of the things in Arnold Laurie's uh, theories, and it's, again, it's a theory of Fukushima, and you can watch it in, on YouTube. There's two parts to it. I had asked Maggie Gunderson um, when I had a phone call with her back in July what she thought about this theory, and she said, well, really, none of it's verifiable. But then the MIT research about the ionosphere disturbances came out after that, and in addition to that, I came across this clip that I sent you with Jim Walsh talking about the MOX fuel from Russia. Yeah, well, here, let me play this because it's, I mean, it, it, it literally, I like how he tucks it in there. Just like all this other pertinent information you always gets stuck in somewhere along, you know, uh, a bunch of crap or, or less important information. Because sometimes it, it's hidden in, inside other information, but it's just not as important. And listen, he verifies what she just said. Zero 
earlier today. Again, you were saying that this was stuff that was bought from Russia that had been had been used, am I right, in their nuclear weapons program? And rather than keep it, have let them keep it or just bury it where who knows whose hands it would have turned up in, we decided to buy it and use it for nuclear power. So, but it, it raises all these other issues. We don't know how it's going to act if it in fact gets out into the atmosphere. Elliot, that's exactly right. You know, and it's sort of deeply ironic and, and unfortunate. So. You know, the U.S. and the Soviet Union are reducing their nuclear arsenals. We want them to reduce their nuclear arsenals. We want to... Uh, did you hear what he said? He said, we. Are we French? What is this we crap? I thought it was the Japanese. So whose money was used to pay for that? Was that was U.S. tax dollars at all used to fund any of this purchase for, for you know, TEPCO over there? I mean, that's something we should look into as well. That's a good question because he just said we. Why didn't he say Japan? And this guy agreed to it. And then, like you said, Christina, you didn't see too many interviews with this guy afterwards. Gee, I wonder why. Right. They're probably like, shut him up. <laughs> he said too much. Shut him up. There was a researcher from MIT that died in 2004. He was actually beaten to death in his driveway. He had recently published an open letter outlining the results of the past 15 years of his research that he had done on free energy, and he was convinced, and he said so in this open letter, that it was only a matter of months before the world would see a free energy device. Well, if that came true, we wouldn't need nuke plants anymore. And the reason we need nuke plants is to collect all the plutonium that they generate to make bombs so we can go blow the crap out of other countries. It's actually a completely inefficient way of boiling water. That's all nuke plants do, is boil water. Yeah, we should use geothermal energy. Way more efficient and pretty much endless because it comes from the, the core of the planet itself. You know, you bring up an interesting topic. You bring up the death of the scientists. You have a list, right, of all these dead uh, nuke scientists that are, you know, that have turned up dead, let's we'll say, in the past 20 years or so, somewhere around there? I've, yeah, I've, I've got a list. I, I started putting together today a little bit because there were a few names that kept coming up. Some of them were murders. Some of them were suicides. Some of them were suicides that were later determined by second autopsies to be murders. And they're from all different countries. And basically, all these people were, were physicists that were doing some type of contract work. Um, in the U.S., well, one of them that was... Uh, was pretty well known was a guy named John Mullen who was 67 at the time that he died and he died of a huge ingestion of arsenic back in 2004 and they've never determined where the, the source of that arsenic came from and then more recently there was a suicide in fact it was a week after 311 a guy named Roger Lynn Dickey who was 56 died after jumping off a bridge into the Rio Grande Gorge exactly one week after 311 he was a nuclear scientist contracted with Sandia Labs, which is the division of Lockheed Martin. And Sandia Labs does research in the field of energy, climate, and infrastructure security. In Russia, all the way back in Chernobyl, the head of the government commission, his name was Valery Lagosov, he was, he was set up to deal with the Chernobyl disaster, and he actually hung himself in the stairwell of his, of his apartment on the two-year anniversary of Chernobyl. Before he did that, though, he made an audio tape, and he revealed previously undisclosed facts about the disaster. And I always say this, if you want to know what's going on with Fukushima, look at Chernobyl, because it's textbook. Some of his disclosure included the fact that there was political pressure for him to censor his data, even though he was the head of the agency supposed to be investigating Chernobyl. He was prohibited from speaking out about it. He tried to speak out about it in front of the IAEA and at a conference held in Vienna. And in trying to do so, he felt that his career and his reputation was damaged beyond repair. Um, Boris Yeltsin actually awarded him with the Hero of the Russian Federation title after his death. And he was very well-liked and very respected by his colleagues. Um, he's in most of the films. If you watch any of the films about the Chernobyl disaster, he's interviewed quite frequently. And he was very close to the liquidators. And he often 
downplayed the effects of radiation with his humor. That's what he was known for. Do you um, think? Do, do, let me ask you this: Does is it? Does the evidence point to the fact that he he offed himself for real? He offed himself. He made this that, audio tape just, before beforehand. And, oh, so and it really was a suicide in his case because he probably had that a lot. Was, of that really was a suicide. Oh, there was uh, another guy from the UK named Timothy Hampton. He was forty-seven, and he fell to his death from the seventeenth floor of the UN building in Vienna. His office was on the sixth floor, but he jumped off the 17th floor. And he had been monitoring nuclear tests by Iran and North Korea back in 2009. And a second autopsy that his family did revealed that he had actually been strangled and thrown off the building. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, seems to happen a lot. A lot of these scientists, and we're going to get more into it and coming back on the other side of the break, but a lot of these scientists seem to have mysterious deaths like that. They, they just, I guess they choke themselves to death and then throw themselves off a building because that happens all the time. That's normal. And people buy this. That's what really gets me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. Bottom of the hour. Stay tuned for Christina's forecast coming up in a few seconds. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. And before we got cut off, uh, Christina was getting into the list of dead nuke scientists, or I should say uh, scientists that have ended up dead uh, via mysterious circumstances, whether it would be quote-unquote suicide uh, that later turned out to be homicide or thrown from a 17th uh, story you know, on a building after being strangled. Very uh, interesting things. And what was his one? The, the British guy what was his name David Kelly, right? He was wasn't he a, a weapons inspector or something? And he had he had been to Iraq or, or, or uh, I think it was Iraq he had been to, and he ended up getting tossed out a window. Uh, really? In the UK, there's a ton of them. Even on just on Wikipedia alone, there was, there was like a hundred like assassinations. Not all of them new scientists. A lot of them are biological uh, weapon scientists, also. That have all been killed by the Israeli group, the intelligence and special ops group, the Mossad. Oh yeah, the they're the ones that took out that been... that guy in Iran a couple weeks ago. The magnetic bomb from a motorcycle is their mo. Yeah, that that was the latest one. There's actually been five Iranian nuclear scientists though that had been either attacked or killed in the past two years, and and one of the worst ones was. On July 23rd of last year, they shot a guy through the throat outside of his daughter's kindergarten. I mean, they're they're just, you know, they don't like what you're saying. They don't like what you're doing. They just take you out. And the official response from the Western governments is that they condemn that kind of action. But Rick Santorum said, you know, the Christian fundamentalist, quote, on occasion, scientists working on the nuclear program in Iran turn up dead. I think that's a wonderful thing, candidly, end quote. Mm. That's not shady. These attacks, they're they're not undermining Iran. If anything, they seem to be creating more of a sense of urgency. And in fact, 1,300 students at one university changed their majors to nuclear science after this latest guy was killed with the motorcycle bomb. But does 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 any of this surprise you? I mean, uh, it, you know, when you look into it and you see that all these scientists, one of the things they have in common is that they seem to be working on something that could benefit the, you know, New World Order or whatever you want to call it, Illuminati, you know, whether it be biological, radiological, whatever. You know what I mean? It's not like you know, water treatment, you know, guys are, are dropping dead. It's, you know, maybe they are too in certain places, but like the the vast, uh, some of them seem to take place in certain areas that the government just so happens to have, or I should say the shadow government, because I don't like to say the government because it's not like the mailman's involved. You know what I mean? But a, uh, you know, this inner cabal, whatever you want to call it, it, it seems to benefit their agenda and that's what, you know, all, always these scientists seem to end up dying of, you know, heart attacks or shooting themselves in the head or, you know. And by the way, I don't know who's organizing the shooting of the, the, the people in the head, but it's hard to shoot yourself in the back of the head with a shotgun, a pump shotgun twice. 
just so mm-hmm. you know. That looks shady. Okay, I just want to throw that out there. But you know what I mean? I mean, they, they do all this. Stuff. You know what? Type in the um, oh, on YouTube, just type in dead scientist, like dead bio uh, weapon scientist or something like that, or dead nuke scientist. And there's a video out there. It's uh, I think it's like seven or eight minutes long. And it's got a list of all these scientists and like what they did and how they died and like the circumstances and how how shady it was and everything else. It's just ridiculous the amount that is out there. And what what about in the past, let's say, um, year? How many how many quote unquote suicides have there been in the past year? Yeah, um, I don't I don't know the the one on the Rio Grande Gorge that was a, a pretty uh, major one that did hit mainstream. Because he was a new scientist, and that was, you know, some speculation. What did he, what did he know? I didn't know he was also working with climate and and international security issues. Because you know, if we have Stuxnet or Israel has Stuxnet, you know, what's to say Iran isn't developing that too? And then we've got, you know, plants over here. In the last few days, after you know, we we may be possibly implicated in having something to do with these Iranian nuclear scientists being killed. Um, you know, we have plants that go down with cooling problems and broken pipes. How, how do you miss broken pipes? And not yeah. just one, a number of broken pipes. Well, see, that, that's why it's facility. kind of shady because all these reactors are having problems and there just so happens to be a virus out there that causes some of these certain problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not the only uh, country that, that has hackers that can develop this stuff. And, and Iran loves to retaliate. You know, the Pan Am bombing was in retaliation over Lockerbie, Scotland. That was in retaliation for the U.S. Navy downing an Iran airliner over over the Straits of Hormuz in 1988. And they, there was like 300 yeah. civilians that died in that plane crash. And then they did Lockerbie. It was quote-unquote accidental. Was, just all this espionage and, you know, all the, the politics and the sabotage and even Tesla was sabotaged by our own government, pulled the funding for his free energy project because J.P. Morgan, who owned all the copper mines, which made all the telegraph wires, didn't want the free energy to be out there. So he actually got the federal government to pull Tesla's funding in the U.S., and they burned down his plant, but they they had built him a lab in Long Island, and they burned it down. Oh yeah, and when he died, the FBI was waiting for him, and they as soon as like his last breath was out of his mouth, and they were raiding his crap. Mm-hmm. And they took everything under the guise of national security. They love that term. Every time they want to hide something, they they we we have to hide this from you. The guise of national security. The knowledge could hurt you. No, I think the knowledge could hurt you. That's the problem. And, you know, a lot of these scientists are probably just, you know, um, middle class people just doing their job. They get caught up in this stuff and they, they stumble across something because they're good at their job or they're being used to send a message and to scare other people in that industry. And, um, you know, it's, it's sad. Hey, this last guy that they blew up with the motorcycle bomb, it wasn't just him that got killed. His driver got killed. And two other people, one of them was his wife, were severely injured. They were all in the car together. Collateral damage, they don't care. No. But, you know, if we're doing it to them, they're probably going to do it to us, too. And well, why, first of all, why would we be surprised if, you know, people would be surprised if we got it. To, first of all, if we attack Iran, like we bomb them like they're trying to, and then they attacked us back, uh, they would, they would, our government would say, oh, it's terrorism. They're blood. No, they're, in re- they're just retaliating. We already attacked them. And we've done it. Mo- we're, we're, we're provoking them. You know, this is how mm-hmm. World War II was started. We did the same things behind the scenes. We provoked Japan before they came and attacked us on, at Pearl Harbor. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, and they get mad at me. You know, oh, Popeye, that's horrible. Pearl Harbor was a disaster. People were killed. Yeah, and they knew it was going to happen, and they let it. And, you know, I felt the same way when I first heard about 9-11. And it, it was probably seven or eight years before I caught on to that and then, you know, started seeing videos from engineers and demolition experts all saying the same thing. And... You know, when it, it's hard looking at friends that live in New York and, and like to even talk to them about it, but even they have kind of caught on to that. There's, 
there's so much more going on than what people realize, and you're not gonna you're not gonna get this from Diane Sawyer, and you're not gonna get it from the evening news. You might as well just turn it off because it's just a big distraction and it's just a big lie. And you make your own observations and do your own research. Uh, I suggest if you're gonna deprogram yourself, what I've done is I've taken uh, you know. You, you take radio shows or uh, videos, movies, whatever, with factual info and stuff, and you load them up like on your iPod, and when you're out doing stuff, you listen to a broadcast or you mm-hmm. listen to you know the movie, and even if you're not quite paying attention, you're just kind of half listening, your subconscious is, and it, it'll help beat back that program by the you know lamestream media or as uh, my good buddy Joe – uh, his wife Angie likes to call them the mainstream mafia. I think she came up with the appropriate name for them. <laughs> and uh, you know they they lie, they cover up things. Uh, they they certainly don't aren't going to tell you the truth. They laugh when even talking about Fukushima. They laugh. Mm-hmm. Ann Coulter, remember her going on Fox News? She was on O'Reilly and she said radiation is good for you. That people of Japan should be happy because now they won't get cancer. And I can't stand O'Reilly, but I, I have to give him credit on this one. He even looked at her cross-eyed like, what the hell did you just say on my show? And I can't stand him, okay, ladies and gentlemen. I think O'Reilly's a jerk-off. But the, even he looked at her and was like, that was the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard. So there you go. The, the mainstream media doesn't care about you. Support the alternative media. Support people like the rad chick because she's telling you the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. We'll be back. Final segment. Stay tuned. All right, so I promised solutions, ladies and gentlemen, and as always, uh, I like to try to leave on somewhat of a positive note. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes my show is just packed with info, and we're, talk- we're talking about tons of stuff. But tonight, we've been talking about some heavy things. Uh, we even touched on the conspiracy end of it, and, and I hope that uh, maybe people that haven't researched Fukushima, maybe uh, you haven't been interested in it or whatever. You're really not that worried about it. Maybe the conspiracy end of it will will draw you in. So uh, that is the the goal of talking about some of this stuff tonight. Uh, what, I'm not saying you have to believe anything. Again, let the facts let the facts lead you where they may. But hopefully, maybe it'll inspire you to at least research what's going on with Fukushima and educate yourself. Now, on that note, I want to talk solutions, and I've talked with Christina about solutions before and I believe it would be proper for me to leave you know tonight on a somewhat of a positive note so Christina the ship is yours take her away and tell people how they can at least uh, mitigate their exposure because we're all being exposed to this on one level or another but we need to try to mitigate it through what we eat and our health so go ahead and the helm is yours well, you know, I try to tell people, like, just do do what you can and try to just in, start incorporating these things into your life. It took me a while to even get my family to, to start doing this stuff on a regular basis. What really put us into high gear was in the last couple of weeks when I got a brand-new Geiger counter, and I've been running that thing 24-7. And today I had two, two times um, where the, the radiation levels in my house were double hazmat levels, and they hung out there for about a minute. And, you know, whether it's coming from Fukushima or from the sun reacting with stuff in our air or from, you know, localized plant problems, it's, it's all bad. It's all out of our control, really, but the things that you can control are, are your own health and, and taking care of yourself, and there's really been no better time to start doing that than now. Um, filtering your water is really important because after it's in the air and it rains, it gets into the, the water system. And um, tap water right now is showing, you know, even though it's minute levels, if you're drinking it all day long or, for God forbid, you're mixing baby formula or anything with tap water, like you're, you're exposing, you know, your family to, to radiation and, and without the measuring instruments that we need or any kind of EPA data, it's better just to assume everything's radioactive right now until we know more. And I'm not doing that to scare people. I'm just saying make these changes and then forget about it. Live healthier and do the things that you can do or you can afford to do. If I could afford it, I would get a reverse osmosis system for my house. 
where it filters all your water. Um, but I can't, so I buy the grocery store water, and it's like 39 cents a gallon. You know, cut down on your dairy because it's in the cows and it's in the meat, and it gets stronger as it goes up the food chain. So if you're eating animals, you're getting exposed to more of it than if you're eating plants. Um, wash all your produce really well and use a little bit of baking soda and just soak it in case there's particles on it. I've detected um, radiation on lettuce that I bought that was from California, and after I, I soaked it in baking soda and tested it again, it was fine. So it was something just on the outside of the lettuce. But, you know, it's you can't drive yourself crazy running around all the time measuring everything with a Geiger counter. For me, I'm doing it because I'm trying to get a handle on this, so I'm giving people the right information. But for right now, if you just make simple changes, you know, like getting enough sleep, taking supplements that boost your immune system, like uh, vitamin C and um, vitamin D is good. Um, there's some things you can ingest in case you've eaten any food that might contain radioactivity. Some people are really worried about it or mixing a spoonful of bentonite clay into their food and clay binds to the particles and it passes right out of you. Um, apple cider vinegar does the same thing. So it's, I just use that as salad dressing now. We eat a lot of garlic. I cook with a lot of spices. Turmeric um, is a really good one. Rosemary. And there's some really good detox sites online and you can look up anti-cancer foods, foods that are high in potassium and, and try to cook as much from, from scratch using whole foods because when you eat processed foods or, or junk food or fast food, you're, you're not getting any nutrition at all and, and you really need to keep your body in as good a shape as possible because your body has the ability, even if you're exposed to radiation, you can heal a lot of it if you're being healthy. And um, the other thing we have to worry about too is like viruses and bacteria can mutate very easily from radiation that makes them stronger. And so if you already have a bit of a weakened immune system, uh, radiation will do that too. It will actually affect your immune system. Uh, you want to do everything that you can to protect that. And, you know, just in my own family, I've been sick for the last month and a half, and I'm mitigating. And I've got bronchitis that I can't get rid of. And, you know, I'm, I wouldn't let your kids play in the snow, and I wouldn't let them out in the rain. And if you do get caught in the snow or rain... And, take, and make them take a bath and, and put some baking soda in the bathtub with them. And then you don't have to worry about it. And just make these simple changes because it could be months or years before we really know. I mean, look at just what happens in one day with the levels from a broken pipe at TEPCO. You know, it gets a thousand times higher in the span of a few hours. Everything that they've told us always turns out to be thousands or millions of times worse than they originally said. And with that kind of track record and knowing the effect that radiation can have on people's health, I think it's just better to make these simple changes. And even if there was no radiation at all, you're living healthier, so it's no lose. And the other thing that's really important is to talk to people about this because there's still, you know, 90% of people have no idea that this is going on. They all think the reactors are in cold shutdown because that's what they talk about on the nightly news. Well, Fox News tells them that it's, you know, turned off and everything's A-OK. -okay. CNN tells them that, you know. The president says everything's OK. Obama waved his magic wand and made the, made the BP oil spill go away. So apparently he did the same thing and he made Fukushima go away. It's not an issue anymore. It's, it's pretty freaking far from OK. And I don't know that it's ever really going to get better. Just knowing what's going on there and knowing that they have no ability to contain it whatsoever. You know, this is what we have to look forward to, really, realistically, for the next 30, 40, or 100 years until those plants somehow get contained. And TEPCO has said 30 to 40 years. Physicists have said it's going to take centuries. And it's going to take hundreds of billions of dollars. And they are burning through people working at that plant like crazy, either because they're getting sick or they're dying or they're not showing up to work. People are unskilled. You know, they're fixing stuff around the plant with plastic bags and duct tape. And oh, oh, that's nice. 
exact pictures that, of that's... it on my on my on my Facebook page. It's just insane. Give out your Facebook page again so people can go check it out. Rad chick radiation research and mitigation. But if you just search for radiation, it'll pop up along with some other cool sites that you should check out. And then sham around the place. Share the forecast because the, the forecasts are actually. Um, doing pretty well at like predicting where the highest fallout was going to be. And it's just really simple stuff. I mean, it's not rocket science. This has all been studied in the past by the civil defense department. There's just boatloads of research that I've been referring to and I've been watching this for 10 months and seeing what happens when certain weather conditions interact with each other. And it's really not that difficult to predict. What we need is every single weather caster in the country doing it from a local standpoint, because, you know, I hate just saying, okay, everybody in Kentucky needs to stay inside today. <laughs> but, you, and I, you know, you have to think that some of them are being complicit with not saying anything because th they have to hear things. They're in the industry. I'm sure they get an email, you know, from some scientist here or there or somebody says, hey, did you check out the elevated readings, blah, 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 blah. They just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm sure they know. I mean, they, they pay attention to NOAA. They, they have to know about this. The, the government knows. They're just not releasing things. Mm -hmm. They're just not telling you. Now, Canada, on the other hand, they just turned their meters off. Talk about denial. They just stuck their fingers in their ears and went, la, 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 we're not going to look, la, 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 la. We don't, we, radiation, we don't know what you're talking about, Fukushima, la, la, la. I mean, that's, that's scary. For the listeners that or are they Canada, raise, Or they raise the levels that are allowable. I think oh, they were yeah, they did that like here. 20 times. Yeah, they what don't shut our meters off. They just say, hey, look, it's okay now. You know, what, what would kill you before won't kill you now. You know, don't yeah. it. it's good for you. They don't care if people get sick. All you do is make money for the healthcare industry if you get sick, which is, you know, now one of the, the biggest uh, industries that we have in the States, and it's probably going to get a lot bigger. But instead of focusing on building cancer centers, they should be telling people how to mitigate. You know, a lot of doctors aren't doing that because they're not getting any direction from the AMA, the CDC, because nobody's talking about this. And if you look into it, just look at Chernobyl and look at the research that's been done on people around there, even when they were exposed to low levels. They still came out with thyroid cancer. You know, is that going to be the end of things? No, I've heard from tons of people that were, you know, victims of Chernobyl that had cancers and they've gone on to live healthy, productive lives. But they've had to take an interest in their health, and I'm just saying, do that now. Don't wait to get sick to do it. And if you start seeing signs of bloody noses and hair loss and, and extreme fatigue, or you have trouble getting over an illness, you know, those are early indications that you're suffering from radiation exposure. It Ladies doesn't and make gentlemen, everybody start we're going to get cut off, uh, Christine. i got to cut you off. We're going to get cut off, but please... Listen to what she said tonight. Go back, grab the archive, and pay attention to her YouTube channel. Pay attention to her on Facebook. Check out FukushimaFacts.com.